I am Dr. Amrish Mittal and today you are joining me on this rather unique show called Metabolic Rodina and I think it's a brilliant idea to have a discussion about science about research about patient care in the open and blind air as they say uh, and I think uh, I am quite looking forward to this uh, experience uh, quite a unique idea let's see how it goes Good morning, Dr. Hi. Mittal. I'm Hi. here. <laughs> so basically, this is a metabolic uh, sort of role in R, and we're going to do it in open air. So we're trying to blend history and nature with science. Yeah, that will be fun. Yes. And today's topic, as you know, is something of your special interest. That is, we're going to talk about uh, fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or metabolic associated fatty yes, liver disease. Yeah, yeah. So I look forward to this discussion and we'll go to some interesting parts of Delhi and do that. Yeah, I, I think it will be interesting, yes. So, I was concerned, you know, it might be raining. How it has been raining in Delhi yeah, for if, the last several days. I mean, it's a clear day, but yeah, I expect it to be very humid. Let's see. The sky is clear, it's blue, and there are white clouds floating. So maybe it won't be humid. Let's see. Uh -huh. It's a good time to go early in the morning. Yes, Otherwise, yes. It's very crowded. Yeah, definitely. It's not nice. And also, we won't get to talk after a little while and it'll become hotter. So, I think this is the best time. Yeah. During the pandemic, I, I discovered Delhi. So, I thought, you know, everyone knows. Lal Kila and Kutub Minar, you know, they are famous places. Uh, and, uh, you know, most of Delhi is associated with Mughal monuments. But there is a very rich pre Mughal history. So I was trying to look at these places, and what I discovered was right next to my house in Basant Kunj is this place called Sultan Gadi, which uh, was the first Islamic museum in, in Delhi and perhaps in North India for sure. The interesting part is that that place is a site of great importance, faith, and belief for all the local people. This is an Indo Africa Friendship Park. This is all the diplomatic area. So, Indo Africa Friendship Park rose both the children. So, after this nice ride on Sunday morning, uh, we are now at our first actual location. Uh, Kiara Murti. Yeah. Uh, this is a, represents the Dandi March. Yeah, Miss Gandhi and by a famous sculptor called Devi Prasad Roy Chaudhary, who actually this is a very rich sort of uh, uh, symbolic sculpture and represents many many things. It's one of the landmarks of post independence India. Okay. Yes. Gandhi ji leading the Dandi mm -hmm. March. Mm -hmm. So you know. We were going to talk today about uh, NAFLD as it is commonly called. Uh, for a long time, we know that uh, fatty liver. Yes, you know, in yes. my time, fatty liver was just a fatty liver. And even till recently, we didn't really think too much about it. We thought it's unimportant. We thought it's irrelevant. It's not going to add anything much. It's just a finding that is there. Yes, especially yeah. in our context with regard to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. But as work has shown uh, in the recent past that this actually may represent an, a metabolic abnormality, part of the whole system, Spectrum. the gamut yeah. of yes. metabolic abnormalities, and may have direct implications. And while the fatty liver itself may arise as a consequence of uh, of uh, insulin resistance, resistance yeah, that is but right. then the impact of, of, of that can be on many things and associations with cardiovascular disease, etc. have been pointed out. So let's first start by, uh, I want to pick your brains. I know this has been a very uh, strong area of interest for you. So what do you think about the nomenclature? Because a lot of yes, discussion yeah. and I, uh, you know, and whether it should be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. What, yes. is your, what is your thought about that? Yeah, as rightly pointed out, we, we know that liver stores fat in liver uh, fatty liver happens because of alcohol it's well known that if you consume excess of alcohol it leads to accumulation of fat in liver for liver fat storage liver is not the proper place there is a fat store dep depots in the body 
So alcohol does this. It was known for a long time. So in early 80s, it was found that there happens this buildup of fat in liver in people who were not consuming alcohol. So because at that time, we were not knowing what causes this buildup of fat in liver in people who are not consuming excess alcohol. So they call it non-alcoholic fatty liver. So this name, it tells you that what it is not. It doesn't it's tell you what quantity. it is. Yes, so quantity. yes. So in recent years, there's a huge debate for this changing its name and telling what it is actually. It Now we know quite surely that it is because of insulin resistance and it has strong association with met metabolic syndrome. So that is why you must have heard that it is now known as metabolic associated fatty liver disease. This is a positive name because it tells you what it is. So this is, there is a debate and you know, more, many uh, endocrinologists, many hepatologists are of the opinion that this should be the name rather than the non-alcoholic, which the disease is not actually. I mean, that was, it was presumed that uh, liver disease of this type is caused by alcohol. Yes, and, yes. Uh, also, the prevalence of non-alcoholic or metabolic associated fatty liver disease was very low as that has gone up and recognition is improved, both yes, in both yes, yes, yes. But also the prevalence of metabolic syndrome, of diabetes has exponentially increased all these metabolic abnormalities. So it has become an entity in its own right rather than being an exclusion. Yes, yes. Diagnosis. So yeah, we, uh, this is a diagnosis of inclusion. Now you, you, whenever you say metabolic associated fatty liver disease, immediately know what is the cause. Correct. Correct. Now, non-alcoholic, what it is not. Yes. So yeah, this is the uh, latest development that we are now thinking of changing its name. Because you know also the, the, the prevalence is so high and the impact is so significant that it's become like a separate organ which is associated or even you can say arises as a complication of, of, uh, uh, of, of diabetes. So, yes, yes. So that thing, whether fatty liver is an association of diabetes and part of metabolic syndrome, or is it really a complication of diabetes? Yes, that yes. of course uh, is, is yeah. a matter of. Discussion. Because you know that insulin resistance is the main pathogenic process for type two diabetes. So that is why, and insulin resistance is also the main pathogenic process for fatty liver disease that we know now, non-alcoholic fatty right. liver disease. The, the, so the root is same for both the diseases and the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we'll call it fatty liver disease. So the prevalence is very high in patients who also have diabetes, type 2 diabetes precisely. It is 60 to 70 percent of your patients that you see in your clinic who have type 2 diabetes also have fatty liver disease. So yes, prevalence is very. And in those who have BMI, of more than 40 who are obese, very obese, the prevalence is as high as 90 percent. So and in the community level, the prevalence is 25 percent, which is very high. One in four people have fatty liver disease. Yeah, the, the prevalence is very high. So, so think, it is a serious I, I condition. The whole thing has moved around uh, from like like the diabetes has grown exponentially. Take diabetes as, as a sort of uh, index yes, yes. And, and you see that that diabetes has increased exponentially and if you look at the data on diabetes prevalence in India for example in the 70s done by professor Ahuja it is like two percent or something in rural areas yeah it's three four percent in urban areas yes. and you can see it has really gone up very very significantly and obesity has gone up yes so these are all running in parallel yeah and therefore this kind of fatty liver disease as we are calling it has also increased which was there earlier a little bit not it, so yes, significant, yes, yes. not recognized now it has increased exponentially Definitely. has an impact on our health and is also increasingly recognized yes so i think yeah. that's a, that's a, that's the right way to look at it yeah look at it as a component like when we think of for example type 2 diabetes uh, you think of heart you think of kidney you think of nerves, feet, yes. you think of eyes, 
but you also have to think of how yeah liver, liver. yes that's the way we have to tailor our thinking yes uh, to look at the liver and we'll come to that in in greater detail yes but the important point here is that uh, uh, you know for those of you who don't know actually uh, dr shafi and i have been working on non alcoholic fatty liver disease or metabolic associated fatty liver disease for the last several years and including looking at molecules that will change uh, or improve fatty liver disease not de novo but anti diabetic molecules that will also help in that and we'll talk about that and we also uh, have recently published the prevalence of fatty liver disease in a clinic population of type 2 diabetes and the figures that dr shafi puchai told are are quite remarkable and striking actually that in at least in a private paid relatively affluent patient population the prevalence of fatty liver disease in people attending a diabetic clinic or an endocrine clinic is very high it's extraordinarily high i mean 60 70% of your patients would have some degree of fatty liver if they have type so i think it's important to understand that as he explained in those who are obese the prevalence goes up even more yeah so you know uh, i think these are very very important points to remember that and we are talking of india we are not talking of the obese obese patients that we often find in the west especially in the us we are talking of indian patients who are often not that overtly obese but even there the prevalence of fatty liver has gone up exponentially and more and more data is coming out on that and we need to understand i think uh, uh, the other important part is i don't really care why should i care if there is some fat in my liver yeah i mean why is uh, why is fat important and i think we need to understand that very clearly why is fat in the liver that you are talking about is it is it of any significance at all or is it just you know maybe there is a fat that's all right why should we care about uh, liver fat at all uh, shafi what are your thoughts on this yeah so we know that you know this uh, due to this lifestyle change urbanization you know we consume a lot of calories in excess related to your physical activity so you have more calories in your body now the question is why to keep these excess calories because your body has a limit to store it in adipose tissue fat stores when you have excess calories and your fat depots are you know there comes a limit so liver is a very important organ for metabolism of calorie so it converts it into fat droplets and stores in liver liver is not a normal place for storage of fat so in many patients in many people in this fat is benign it is you know storage to some extent it can tolerate but if there is a chronic and excessive storage of fat in liver it doesn't stop there only for storage part it now begins to you know harm your liver cells it causes inflammation in the liver it then if inflammation continues it then causes scarring of liver so you slowly and slowly your liver gets scarred and it disrupts the normal functioning of the liver and what you commonly call cirrhosis scarring of liver then liver is not able to function properly to do its routine work to maintain your body so there comes the problem so a small proportion of patients a small proportion of people who have fatty liver or uh, they progress further to inflammation to scarring and excessive scarring and then abnormal functions of the so liver the, the key point here is that not all fat is just an opus and not all fat is coming from fat sometimes people think i have a low fat diet yeah. so i won't get fat in my liver that's not necessarily true even if you have a high carbohydrate diet even that can lead to accumulation of fat in the liver it all depends on the concentration of free fatty acids in the liver which are the ones that determine as dr kutte explained accumulation of fat in the liver now this fat accumulation in most people is just that it doesn't lead to anything 
but in some people this fat accumulation as pointed out can give rise to inflammation and subsequent to inflammation actual fibrosis or scarring giving rise to cirrhosis of liver and even unfortunately sometimes hepatocellular carcinoma yes. now the thing is that the the pyramid is steep so so you know what happens you start with a very large base of fatty liver and it goes up like that yes. it's not yeah. like going up yeah. like that. Yeah. so by the time you reach uh, liver cancer so to speak then the numbers are very small yes. but there is a catch here the catch here that the base is so wide yes that the number of people who have nafld are so large that even if a very small proportion keeps going up up, up yes, towards the yes. fibrosis stage you will still get very large numbers yeah the peak will still be huge, still huge. yeah so we had done some extrapolation on this <laughs> yes right? yes so the you know one in two out of 10 people who have fat in liver progress to f- progress further yes. but you see when you see the prevalence of diabetes and you see the prevalence of nafld non alcoholic fatty liver disease in diabetes 60% of your diabetes patient have fat so even if one to two persons out of 10 progress so you can 20% of those yes, yes yes so you can see it is still that is why the burden is so high it is still the most com- common co- indication for liver transplantation in west and it is the most common chronic liver disease all over world in india also so i think that's a critical point that's a very very important point to me that while most people with fat in the liver as found on any imaging modality uh, or minor abnormality sometimes the liver function test will continue to be just like that and will not progress to anything very severe or serious the truth is that the base is so large there are so many people affected that that even though the pyramid is narrow and it's steep you will still get a lot of people who reach the stage of inflammation who reach the stage of of fibrosis so that the liver actually packs up and you get liver cirrhosis or sometimes even hepatocellular cancer so the num- absolute numbers are important here and i think we need to keep that in mind while we are talking you know it doesn't matter most of our patients are okay so without creating panic we have to understand that the numbers are very large prevalence is very high you know the impact is is high you know simply because of absolute numbers yeah but i think we need to understand more about the mechanism of how this is happening in the liver yes and i think uh, we should do that at our next site yes basically jo we have to talk about mechanism yeah. we know that the disease is very prevalent and we know that it's causing a lot of problems but what is it in the liver what is it in the liver that actually causes fat to accumulate okay and it also happens in some people it doesn't and, happen in other people yes so what is it there is a lot of variability heterogeneity in this as you rightly pointed out that although many people accumulate liver fat but it doesn't progress in all it Correct. progress in 1 to 2 yeah. per yes. out of 10 as yes. we already discussed so there is genetics at it there so there are many factors we don't know all factors but what happens at the liver level that it all starts from fatty liver acid that is the substrate the free that fatty acid. free fatty acid that is the substrate that liver gets and why does liver get this free fatty acid from it gets it from fat around our organs in the abdomen and beneath the skin that are the actual fat depots of our body okay so insulin is the it holds this fatty acid in these depots but when there is insulin resistance so there is a outflux of fatty acids from these depots they are, they are not able to hold it back so you get lot of fatty acids basically you are saying that the free fatty acids they they are released from adipose tissue sites adipose tissue sites they release free fatty acid the free fatty acid goes to the liver, liver yes. and tends to then produce 
toxicity there. Yeah, we will discuss that. But this is one of the main sources. That is why it is insulin resistance based diseases. Another source is carbohydrates that you eat, especially glucose and fructose. In liver, if you have excess glucose and fructose, it liver converts it into again free fatty acid. We call it de novo lipogenesis right. technically. Right. So now you have a lot of free fatty acids in liver. So what are the liver defense systems for this? Number one, it you know burn down this free fatty acid in the mitochondria. We call it beta oxidation. So. But when you have a lot of, you know, free fatty acids, yes. mitochondria, they don't keep pace with this. And a lot of toxic substances are produced. This is one path. Second path is liver converts this free fatty acid into neutral fat. We call it triglycerides and put it in VLDL, lipoprotein, and put it again into circulation. That is why, as you have seen that in type 2 diabetes, where insulin resistance is the base, they have high triglycerides because VLDL is the carrier of triglycerides. So these are the two pathways. Basically, it's uh, triglyceride accumulation in the liver. This triglyceride accumulation in the liver, that is supranormal. Yes. And and, and that or abnormal. Yes, is that is abnormal. Instigating sometimes the inflammatory pathway also. Yes. So, so these are two mechanisms, uh, mitochondria pathway yes. and VLDL. And so actually we should have low amounts of free fatty acids so that these two pathways are enough to take it out. So when your free fatty acid level is high, so another pathway is store this triglyceride in the liver because there is no other place Correct. Why, what Correct. to do. Correct. So this is the third storage of fat in liver that we call fatty liver. So this is third. And for a long time, it remains neutral. It doesn't cause any harm. But when you have ongoing, you know, onslaught of this free fatty More acid, free yeah, free fatty acid, diet, diet, and, and, and insulin resistance, store, yeah. yeah. So, so free diet also means not just a fat rich diet. Yeah, carbohydrate and fructose. Fructose is very important because a lot of carbohydrate diet me hoga. Yeah. Or they say Indian ski carbohydrate rich diet say. Usse jo accumulation of free fatty acids, yes. exposure of liver to free fatty acids, so that the two classic pathways of metabolism are bypassed. They are overwhelmed. They are overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Yes. Not bypassed. Overwhelmed. overwhelmed. And there is accumulation. Yes. The yes. So right. And when this goes chronically and you have excess food intake, that is carbohydrate, now during these processes, some lipid species are formed. For example, we call it lysophosphatidic acid, DAG, diacyl, glycerol, yes. ceramides. Yes. These are toxic. Liver can handle them when they are um, in Very minute amounts. amounts. When you have huge amounts of these, yeah. they elicit inflammatory reaction. Yeah. They, call oxi they, they act as oxidants. Yeah. They cause endoplasmic reticulum dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. So now the hepatocyte is not able to do it is normal processing. Yeah. It's normal functioning. And inflammasomes are active, they, they get activated. Yes. And now the cell, they produce interleukins that Correct. are inflammatory, inflammatory substrates. Yeah. And it, you know, uh, it attracts these inflammatory immune cells from the blood. That is polymorphonuclear cells, Correct. macrophages, natural killer cells. So, so ultimately, what is going to happen with this inflammation is that some of this will still remain at inflammation. Yes. And some of this will progress to further stellate cell fibrosis. I think we'll discuss this at yeah. our next part. Yes. Thank you. Definitely. So, uh, you know, we've now reached this very interesting monument. Many people just walk past it. Uh, this is the tomb of Muhammad Shah mm -hmm. and this is from 1444, so almost 600 ah, years yes. ago. Uh, the so, history. Yeah. You know, if you look at the Delhi Sultanate, uh, there were five dynasties and the first one was the Mamluk or the slave dynasty. The second one was the Tughlaq dynasty. 
second one was Khilji actually, third one was Tughlaq and the fourth one was a Said dynasty. So this is perhaps the only remaining tomb of the Said dynasty. So every dynasty left their, uh, uh, left their mark, you know, in terms of monuments. But I am told that as far as the Said dynasty goes, this is the main tomb. So uh, it's fascinating, it's beautiful. And in, we are here in Lodi Garden. Right. Now, Lodi Garden is, is like the cultural center of Delhi. In a way, it's a public park, but it's a public park that is dotted with unbelievable monuments. So you saw this from yeah. 1444. And if you go to the other end, you will reach Akbar's time. Oh. Uh, so primarily it's a Lodi uh, sort of uh, uh, monument area, but there's one Sayyid monument and one Mughal monument at the end. And in between, the mosques and the mausoleum are all from the Lodi period. So that's the importance of this one. So, you know, Shafi, we were talking about uh, toxic lipid metabolites yes. accumulating in the liver. Yeah. And of course, as we spoke, it's the free fatty acid that starts the whole process. Yes. So the, the thing is that what happens after that? So these toxic metabolites, they are oxidants. They oxidize the surrounding normal organ leads. They also cause, you know, what we call endoplasmic reticulum citrus right, right, in the cell. Right. They also activate inflammatory pathways and cause apoptosis of some hepatocytes, necroptosis, different correct, type of correct, cell deaths. Correct, correct. And ultimately, inflammatory, infl you know, inflammatory substances are produced mm -hmm. like interleukins, mm -hmm. like other, you know, tumor necrosis factor. These are the substances that actually tell the cell that there is some debris, you know, you have to clear the uh, correct, site. Correct. So these substances then attract these immune cells from the circulation, right. like polymorphonuclear cells, macrophages, right. natural killer cells. These right. are different cells right. that are, you know, they, they want to maintain homeostasis in the cell. They mm -hmm. want to clear the debris. But because the, so there is ongoing these processes, lipid toxic, you know, species, the process continues. And hepatocytes liver try to now repair it, regenerate it, but it doesn't keep pace. So ultimately, these cells, the, the death of these cells happens and scarring starts because we know if you get a cut, it heals by scarring. The liver also tries to heal this destroyed you know, area. So they got more and more fibrous tissue is formed to, and this uh, scarring accumulates in the liver, ultimately giving fibrosis. So, so, so what you are saying is that what we understood was that there is accumulation of lipid, toxic lipids in the liver. Yes. That triggers inflammation. Yes. And because of release of cytokines, because of that inflammation, that ultimately triggers fibrosis. Yes. That so, ultimately, they activate, they are called hepatic, hepatocyte uh, satellite cells. So the I thought the satellite cells. The cells are the ones that these actually. These are these are the this is the common final pathway. Right. You get many signals, diverse yeah. signals, yes. Yes. ultimately activating these cells, yeah. which produce fibrosis. Yeah. So there are also natural mechanism hmm. that cause degradation of these this fibrosis, hmm. but the formation is so high, degradation is now so low, ultimately there is accumulation of fibrosis in the liver. So this is what we call it fibrosis. Of the liver. And, and, and then when we move on, some of these convert into frank uh, cirrhosis, of yes, course. Yes. Because we know that in the, it's very important that in the liver, early stages of fibrosis can be reversed. Yes. And we'll, we'll talk oh, about yeah, that when yeah, we talk about yes, management. Yeah. But some of them progress to cirrhosis, actually. And some eventually to hepatocellular carcinomas. Yes. So is right. there what are the predisposing factors? Who goes towards cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma? And as we know, there is obviously some role of genetic alterations in the liver enzymes that also predisposes some of these people to go towards more toxicity yes, and more yes, cirrhosis. Yes. So not just liver enzymes. I mean, the molecules in the pathway of lipid metabolism in the liver, yes. they, can be alter they can be different genetically. That's why some people may be more prone 
to uh, yes. develop this kind of situation so yeah we know that there are many genetic factors these are for example pnpla3 is one tm6 sf2 is one they ultimately if you have a particular you know type of this enzyme it fails to do its normal functioning the liver cell fails to do its uh, normal functioning ultimately leading to excess you know these processes get you know ultimately fibrosis get accumulated in the cell and there happens the normal architecture of liver is important because there is one way of you know portal blood flow and there are there are this lamellar structure when you get accumulation of fibrosis this architecture is distorted yes. yeah you get you know inhibition in yes. the flow yes. that is why yes. portal hypertension develops yes. the and you get nodule formation because regeneration is happening but it is not happening in the way it should have been in a lamellar fashion so you get these nodules Disor disorganized, disorganized disorganized liver you get yes. you know disorganized liver yes. so regeneration is happening destruction is happening now you get disorganization and this is called cirrhosis then Correct. so if you see a cirrhotic liver yes. you will see bumpy surface yes. because these nodules are formed we've been taught that you've yes. been taught that in pathology from day one what a cirrhotic liver looks like yes and you some of you may have felt it those of you who are surgeons may have actually felt a cirrhotic liver so so a cirrhotic liver really is is a nodular liver surface more or less hard liver surface and that uh, just stops short of being like a malignant nodular kind of picture so that is exactly what happens fibrosis and disordered architecture giving rise to a bumpy and and nodular liver that is cirrhosis of liver and that follows nafld as we call it from simple fat deposition to initiation of inflammation to initiation of fibrosis to progression of fibrosis ultimately leading to this condition we are now at uh, sundar nursery one of delhi's premier gardens yes. which has been redone and reopened in 2019 as one of the sort of most popular sites uh, already mm -hmm. has become one of the most popular sites already uh, in delhi for people to spend their time it's a beautiful garden lovely with uh, multiple tombs of noblemen and it's right next to the humayun's tomb oh, so humayun's yeah, tomb is under yeah yeah so sundar nursery is a very interesting area because uh, again it was originally built during the mughal times so oh, it's a old set yeah okay. and subsequently uh, this was you know just some tombs of noblemen but subsequently what happened was that uh, the british actually used this as a tree nursery okay. arboretum okay. okay and so they got trees from all over and that's why it's called sundar nursery it was okay. actually called azim bagh originally azim bagh yeah okay. and so then it became sundar nursery and then again it was there and there were trees and there but then subsequently now the government along with the aga khan foundation has redone the whole thing and it's still in the process uh restored the monuments done you know landscaping it's and they sort of have a water body flowing through like a typical mughal monument yeah, so it's it's a, a, it's a very areas. pleasant and beautiful area and it's become the the hot spot mm. or the popular spot for delhiites uh, for the last two years it's particularly during the pandemic yeah the pandemic yes. became very popular yes. because open air was what was encouraged at that point so let's now uh, continue with our discussions about diagnosis okay yes so uh, a typical thing is to do a liver function test as we all do and we find some alteration in otpt the other thing is ultrasound of the abdomen showing grade 1 grade 2 fatty liver what does this actually tell us what does this actually tell us how useful i mean we understand its limitations yeah, yes, but i yes, wanted yes. to point out how useful is ultrasound for diagnosing this condition for for managing this condition you must have been seeing you know ultrasonography every patient having coming with ultrasonography grade 1 or grade 2 or grade 3 fatty liver but it's not enough to under you know learn this only because you have to manage and you have to prioritize 
which type of you know management you want to give to your patient so for all practical purposes you have we have to think this non alcoholic fatty liver disease as four different conditions so we can then you know prioritize and manage this in a proper way the first is it can be only isolated steatosis isolated fatty liver or it can be inflammation part predominantly we call it nash non alcoholic steato hepatitis yes. yes and third condition it can be advanced fibrosis fibrosis right and fourth it can be cirrhosis correct we also uh, you know subclass cirrhosis into compensated yes. and uncompensated yes. you know decompensated yes. cirrhosis so when you when you learn that your patient is having who just came to you as grade 1 or grade 2 fatty liver but it is actually harboring one of the one of these four conditions right. you have to identify that right. that is called screening right. so so ultrasound you know is not enough now second step is you have to go further unfortunately we don't have robust you know modalities of uh, diagnostic modalities non invasive diagnostic non invasive diagnostic modalities which can tell you with you know 100% accuracy that it is one of these four conditions right. so we have some serological markers which can be used clinically un until we have Correct. more robust yeah. ones Correct. so one is fib4 score yes. so when you apply it it you know includes four parameters one is age another is got gpt and platelet count which are very common parameters so, so again have. so so to decide whom to investigate further yes we use various scores and one of the popular ones that you and i have been using yes. is called the fib4 score yes. and you require very limited parameters you yes. require age of patient which yes. you always always have yeah. platelet count yes. which will be a part of uh, your cbc normally yes. uh, and you require an otpt sgot sgpt and, these and, are and yeah, so if you have these common. four uh, or alt ast you may yeah, call yes, them yes, but if you have these four which you have for all your patients actually yes, anybody yes. treating diabetes will have these parameters yes. so if you have these parameters for your patients then you can definitely uh, uh, calculate a fib4 score, FIB4 score which has right. been shown to have reasonable sensitivity yes uh, and actually even fair yeah. amount of specificity yes. Yes. Uh, for proceeding further yes so the next step then uh, so i think you know in fact even more than just doing ultrasounds perhaps we should invest 30 One, seconds yes. in calculating the fib4 score yes as no. we are calculating egfr correct in all our patients correct. for better management yes because your patient your patients usually have mul multiple conditions correct. like diabetes like hypertension similarly we have to go one step further and major estimate this fib4 score so if your patient has fib4 score it's a online calculator simple yeah, calculator yeah very simple okay. yeah so if the fib4 score of your patient is less than 1.3 so the we we utilize it's one of the you know uh, negative predictive value of this test which is 95% 90 to 95% what does that mean it gives you the probability of you know of your patient having advanced fibrosis so if your patient has fib4 less than 1.3 it means you are patient there is 95% probability that your patient doesn't have doesn't advanced have. fibrosis so so the first advantage of doing a fib score fib4 score is that you can virtually exclude some patients and say that it, this exactly. fib4 score yes. is less than 1. Point, is 1.3 or less yes. then it means we don't really have to worry too much about yeah, the, yeah. that yeah that is it for this yeah. it is a huge chunk yeah. of patient yeah. Yeah. for example if you see 100 patients and almost 70 to 80 percent have fib4 less than 1.3 yes. you don't have to bother about that group only yes. you just give your diabetes management health Correct. lifestyle the management. usual thing that you will tell yes. yes then a small group of patients which have fib4 score more than 1.3 some take 1.45 yes. we will take 1.3 lower one then this group there is high probability yes. that they may harbor this advanced fibrosis or compensated cirrhosis compensated cirrhosis is one where there is cirrhosis but the liver is able to perform its functions normally so it is that group which is 20 to 30% patients now you have to go one step 
further because you have to pick up those Correct. who need our Correct. Correct. you know care and so obviously then ultrasound is not enough for that yeah. right so if we have to name the imaging modalities that we can use by far if you use a fib4 score we typically go for it, the it, liver fibro scan as it is called commonly after this yes. now you have this group of patients yes. who have fib4 more than 1.3 yes. yes. then it is like 20 patients out of yeah. 100 yeah. you can for them you another step is to we go for fibro scan transient elastography or fibro scan this will give you another parameter that is called lsm liver stiffness measurement so now with this it is more accurate it has high you know negative predictive value if your patient has lsm of less than 8 it goes again again you are safe uh, when, yeah when so you you out of those 20 now uh -huh. you also you know exclude another 10 yes, 15 yes, patients yes, yes. who have lsm of less than 8 yeah, that is they don't Absolutely. have advanced fibrosis now there is only 5 to 7 patients yeah. Who, who are advanced fibrosis yes. and you go further yes. there. Yes. You mostly send them to hepatologist yes. or you initiate treatment. Yes. You can initiate treatment if it is from 8 to 12. Yes. So you give them all the benefits of your anti-diabetic treatment that have favorable effect on yes. the liver yes. also. Yes. So it is your as an endocrinologist yes. or a physician yes. or yes. you know any diabetologist yes. work. You give them medicines that are favorable to the liver. And another one, if your LSM is more than 12, it means they have high probability of having harboring cirrhosis. So, so again, uh, as uh, we build the flow chart for you, if the FIB4 score is 1.3 or less. FIB4, yeah, yeah, that is the first yeah, step. Yeah, then, then you can be fairly confident your patient is safe. If your FIB4 score is above 1.4, then you'll go further and you will do what is called typically a liver fibro scan. A liver fibro scan will again give you LSM and LSM of below 8 will again put your patient in the safe zone. And LSM of 8 to 12 is where intervention is required and 13 or above actually indicates very significant disease and the patient has to go to a hepatologist at that level. So that's how we try to classify NAFLD, the severity of NAFLD and the stage of NAFLD or the type uh, of, of your patient based on the simple test of liver fibro scan is not a complicated test anymore. Yeah, it's it's not that expensive also. Yeah. It is non-invasive, takes a few minutes hardly. And I think what I think in my opinion and of course there are other ways we can do the most uh, refined technique, the, the MRI, MRI, PDFF, yeah, yes. we have, you know, we have, we have other even ultrasound based techniques. This some techniques what, look what at fat, common, yeah. yeah, some techniques look at fat, some techniques look at inflammation and some techniques look at cirrhosis, you know, that kind of thing. So fibrosis. So that's how you have to divide. So if you're looking for just fat, you can do an ultrasound, but it doesn't lead you anywhere much. If you're looking for fibrosis, maybe you should do a fibro scan. If you're looking at research or maybe in the future sometime, an MR would also be good. But there are other techniques also. There may be a roller liver biopsy in some cases. Yes. You know, when you're really not sure and you're looking at detailed histology yes. and you're trying to figure out, then a liver biopsy may also be very helpful. But the problem with liver biopsy is, number one, it's invasive. You'll do, them in, you do it in very few patients, yes. really high risk, right? Yeah, yes. Or the other problem is that at times, you may only get information from one segment. Yes. Or one, one spot is, of the liver. So you don't get a full picture that the MR gives. One by 50,000th part of the liver. Yes. So and and, and are, if you have to combine it with variability. imaging, yeah. So there can be variability. We don't hit the right spot. So those are the areas that are, that are important in this. Uh, I think uh, my suggestion in this is, and my feeling in this is, that fibro scans will become part of a specialized diabetes program or clinic. And I, I think more and more people will be getting fibro scans done at lower thresholds yes. even without the FIB4 score even people yeah. will ultimately with the slightest abnormality of LFT or some liver fat on ultrasound will head for a fibro scan. I do see this happening that fibro scans will become a very important part of our armamentarium in managing diabetes along with that associated NAFLD. So I think this is the major change that is 
happening in this area yeah this is good change because otherwise we are missing lot of you know those compensated cirrhosis patients and we are depending only on ultrasound uh, i know yeah. clinical and all of us i mean even the other day i saw a patient who again had nothing he was on follow up once a year coming from uh, eastern part of india and uh, suddenly landed up with a gi bleed yes yeah. and and lft were normal that. throughout the yes, otpt yes, were normal yes, there was nothing yes. else he was a diabetic moderately controlled not bad not good and this time he comes with this bleeding and upper you know upper bleeding. gi bleeding and he is found to have frank cirrhosis and then you feel that every patient should be screened by the way that we are discussing yes. because you will all if you go back to your practice and look there you will find patients who have suddenly come with a decompensated liver disease and bleeding something that you possibly could have helped if you had picked up much yes. earlier or oh, yeah simple fib 4 could have yes, picked correct. it early and you could prevent the purpose of whole this screening part is to prevent those catastrophic events yes upper gi bleeds yes. Yes. and you know uh, encephalopathies yes. Yes. you see patients and upper gi bleed is totally preventable condition yes. you go for prophylactic endoscopic you know ligation of varices so this the purpose of this whole screening is this you pick up those patients which you you may be aware in our latest this uh, study out of 440 40 patients we could pick up 18 patients who had cirrhosis yes yes, yes yes who had cirrhosis full fledged cirrhosis i am so, a co-author yes, on that study yes, so sir. that's that's a re- very very important part out of 440 18 people did not know that they had anything they had cirrhosis Cirro- not yes. fibrosis so, so we are really missing something here and we need to which is why this program we we need to emphasize these Our areas part, yes. uh, uh, and and get our antennae up and really look very hard for for chronic liver disease or liver fibrosis in these patients uh, we are the ones who deal with people with diabetes for example and actually we are more like chronic care physicians so a holistic approach we always worry about their eyes about their kidney about their feet now about their heart a lot also but we often forget the liver so i think the liver is a very why, important why, part why is this it is not only important for hepatologists it is important for us endocrinologists exactly. diabetologists because care. most of these patients come to you yes. first yes. and when they have complications then it is already too late yes. you can't you, you do only prevent to think is then so, so, so for so. us uh, shafi again i'll emphasize that for us uh, endocrinologists diabetologists physicians the role is to avoid our patients reaching the specialist yes. which means yes. if we are doing a good job and our patient is doing a good job he should not reach the nephrologist if we are doing a good job and our patient is doing a good job we should not reach the cardiologist yes. we should not reach the foot specialist similarly we should not reach the hepatologist our patient should not reach the hepatologist if we are alert and aware from the beginning yes. so uh, let's talk a few lines uh, this is not the forum to cover in detail but a few lines about what we can do with management yes uh the key uh is really in the lifestyle the key is in the lifestyle i think it's important that we understand that despite all the discussion that we've had the best way to reduce liver fat is to lose weight yes the most important way and then overall as you said the usual diet and lifestyle and exercise measures that that we advise for people with diabetes or people with who are little overweight or obese so that is very important don't forget the role of lifestyle yes in addition to that dr shafi and i have done studies and there are studies now from all over the world using different anti diabetic molecules which can help reduce liver fat so let me first say a line about pioglitazone pioglitazone is an now an old molecule but which has been shown very clearly to help in uh in 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 uh, NAFLD it can reduce inflammation it can reduce liver fat but pioglitazone comes with a lot of baggage it comes with its own baggage of causing weight gain increase in risk of fractures so on the one hand you're saying you got to lose weight then using a drug that makes a patient put on weight patient is not happy we are not happy so while pioglitazone has been shown to be effective it is sort of static it is there but it's not used as a first choice drug typically for 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 nafld remember no drug is approved by us fda for treating nafld don't forget that and we are not going to talk today about the non 
uh, diabetes medication, which yes. a lot of research is going on, you know, obitocolic acid. There are a lot of things that are happening there. So we are really talking about diabetes molecules that can also help in NAFLD. Yeah. And the first study on that in the SGLT2 group was done on empagliflozin, the E-lift study. Uh, and Shafi, I'd like you to summarize the yeah. findings of the empagliflozin E-lift study. Yes. So empagliflozin, we, uh, you know, di did this study in 2000, we started in 2016 and then it went up to 2018. And we, we so, uh, evaluate the effect of empagliflozin on liver fat only. We didn't look at, you know, fibrosis and other things. So we measured liver fat with MRI PDFF, which is very accurate. It is better than biopsy for estimating liver fat. And we saw that the group that received empagliflozin, they, it, it reduces their fat, liver fat, up to, you know, 4.95%, which is very important for preventing, uh, you know, uh, probably preventing fibrosis and cirrhosis in those patients. But we need actually studies. It is only, you know, we can uh, extrapolate this, that if you reduce fat, you prevent things. We have no studies. Yeah, the real, well, the real yeah, answer will be in preventing be. fibrosis. Yes, but yes. the so, truth is that, that we do did show very clearly that yes. empagliflozin reduced liver fat quite dramatically in yes, some patients, yes, quite dramatically. Yes. And you yeah, know, the response is heterogeneous. Mm. Some people lose very, you know, up to 10%, some lose up to 4%, some lose up to 2%. So on an average, it was up to 5%, yeah. absolute fat. Yeah, yeah, which is a lot, which, which is, is a lot. Which is a lot. Not 5%, 5% of the, of the, in absolute numbers, the yes, fat, not 5% yes. of the existing fat. No. 5%, uh, yeah, it, it means 5% of the weight, the yeah. fat weight yes. of, you yes. know, liver. And because this was first one study, so people wanted to confirm this because it was a big finding. Then placebo control trial was done in Germany, which showed same that it reduces liver fat, especially in those who have more fat in the liver. So later on, it was found that it is a class effect of SGLT2 inhibitors. So it was found with dapagliflozin, it was found with canagliflozin, and it was found with other epragliflozin, which are, you know, available in uh, Japan. So it was found across the you know, all SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, this is SGLT2 inhibitor story and pioglitazone, as pioglitazone. you already, uh, I would mention that pioglitazone reduces liver fat but it puts up, you know, subcutaneous fat, yeah, yeah. yeah which is actually protective, which yeah. it is not very harmful. It's not bad fat, yeah, yeah but bad. still it's fat, you know. It is fat, <laughs> yes, it is fat. So, but uh, one thing I would mention here that we have a group of NAFLD patients of normal BMI. We call it NAFLD in lean patients. Correct. Bioglutazone is a good choice yes. for those patients. We do use it there. Yes, we, we do, do use, use it there. Le lean patients with with NAFLD, yes. they may be candidates for pioglitazone yes, we use because it works well. It works it, well. It works well, and there we don't have this fear of you know gaining weight. Absolutely. And actually, you know, your patients become happy, then I have gained some weight because they are lean <laughs> and the liver yes. fat goes down. Liver fat goes down. So it, this pioglitazone works good in th this group of patient. But the third group, which is very interesting in this, is the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Again, which is a group, as you know, but these newer molecules like SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs, they help control diabetes without producing hypoglycemia and by helping weight loss. Yes. So GLP-1 RA was an obvious choice for us to look at. So when Shafi and I decided we should look at the impact of dulaglutide, for example, which is a once weekly uh, uh, GLP-1 RA on patients with NAFLD on their liver fat using the same MR technology. So, uh, uh, Dr. Shafi, would you like to yes. explain that? So, we, we were aware that liraglutide, which is a daily injection of GLP-1 receptor agonist, it causes weight loss, it, uh, you know, it causes, uh, it improves inflammation and it reduces fibrosis to some extent. It was already, uh, this study was done a couple of years ago, which is called lean study. So that's why the dulaglutide was weakly uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. We tried this and we, we all use the same MRI based technology, MRI PDFF, which for measuring liver fat and it showed beautifully that this GLP-1 receptor agonist, weekly one, it reduces liver fat, 
up to 4.5 percent absolute fat with this it also reduced weight body weight and we, we didn't look at fibrosis and uh, early cirrhosis so we, it confirmed that uh, this uh, you know f fat losing cap you know property of glp1 receptor is a class effect and later on it, it was also seen with semaglutide so it is a class effect as we already discussed about the class effect of G G glt2 inhibitors similarly so uh, overall these three groups of medicine thiazolidine diene that is pioglitazone as glt2 that is mpop bulfloxacin for example and glp1 receptor agonists they have favorable effect on liver and so if you add in, in your patients who are diabetic patients so it is going to help them uh, as far as liver con condition is concerned i think this has been a very stimulating discussion and if i were to summarize for you first the management part and then the discussion for today uh, it is very clear that nafld actually can lead to straight to hepatitis can lead to fibrosis cirrhosis and even hepatocellular carcinoma what is important for us is to learn how to look for it it's a condition that is incredibly common far commoner than we think and looking for it requires the use of simple scores like the fib4 score which are based on sgot sgpt platelet count and age hardly anything and dividing your patients according to that and those with higher fib scores should undergo more testing and the classic test there is the liver fibro scan i'm talking clinical here research wise there are lots of tests the liver fibro scan will again help you stratify your patients and depending on the, on the liver stiffness measurement you could go below 8 8 to 12 or 13 and above below 8 again you are very safe and you don't have to do much except the usual diabetes management and lifestyle 8 to 12 is where you need to seriously intervene and try very aggressive preventive strategies particularly in lifestyle and in choice of drugs which i will just come to and above 13 the patient has to go to the hepatologist it's very important above 13 you have to send your patient to the hepatologist if the lsm is above 13 now having said this what can we do the bulk of management is still lifestyle the bulk of management of nafld is healthy diet regular walking like we are doing this morning uh, and we haven't eaten anything so <laughs> so that adds so eating less walking more and uh, on top of that of course regular you know uh, uh, consultation with your nutritionist or educator is important if you suffer from this condition it's as important to meet them as it is to meet your doctor that is the third then we come to specific medication and while medications designed for nafld are still uh, in the infancy lots of studies are coming out it is very clear that some drugs used for diabetes also help nafld at least reduce liver fat significantly and the three groups as 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 shafi pointed out are pioglitazone sgl2 inhibitors and glp1 ra so if your patient falls in this bracket this should be an added way to help choose medication like we choose medication based on body weight we choose medication based on renal involvement we choose it based on cardiac involvement right that's the guideline we should throw in the liver also here and we should choose medication based on liver involvement fortunately drugs like sgl2 and glp1 rs are becoming very popular in any case because of their effects on overall body fat and long term impact on cardiac and renal parameters so therefore this is an added reason to use these newer drugs in the treatment of diabetes uh, as i said we still don't have data whether these drugs prog uh, prevent progression and fibrosis or 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 uh, uh, progression to cirrhosis but we do know that they reduce liver fat and if you believe that liver fat is a primary trigger for the whole process of inflammation fibrosis cirrhosis uh, you can probably do your patients a lot of good by uh, using the right combination of lifestyle and new medication
Thank you.